The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, uh, so I think we should all be online. Um, thank you everyone for participating today. Um, I believe we have most people on here. Uh, can anyone uh, confirm if they can hear me? You can put a hands up uh, on your GoToMeeting display. Just tag the hands up button and I should be able to know if you can hear me. So thank you, Francis. Um, okay, I think most everyone can thank you, Luis. Okay, good. It looks like we can, we, we're hearing each other. So this is, uh, I believe this is our 12th or 13th webinar session, and it's going to be a little different today. Uh, we're not going to so much focus on something particularly novel or a new functionality in our product. Uh, my name is, well, let me introduce myself. My name is Daniel Humeyer. I'm the Business Development Manager here at Spectrum Center, and I have with me Ross Davison, um, also Business Development Manager for the um, Regions 1 and uh, 3 and Spectrum Center, and I'm focused mostly in Region 2, but um, today is going to be a little bit of like a user user group session. We're, we're, this is not specifically for users, but um, just going to go over some existing functionality in Spectrum E that people had been asking us about to, to, to discuss in a little more detail. So uh, today is going to be focusing on coverage display features in Spectrum E and in particular how we model non-line-of-sight and line-of-sight coverage over medium and high-resolution uh, cartographic data sets. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's not going to be a focus on propagation modeling and things like this so much, just the functionalities inside the Spectrum E tool that uh, we, we've got a lot of questions on, so we wanted to make sure to have a, a webinar on the topic. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and begin the PowerPoint. Now this PowerPoint is also included as a handout and uh, all the attendees should be able to download a copy of it uh, off of this uh, webinar. Um, so let's begin. So for today, uh, we're going to do a little bit of introduction like always and then continue with a little bit of discussion on coverage display features in Spectrum E, how we model medium resolution and high resolution um, digital terrain data, and then a uh, software demo to kind of uh, bring to, to focus the, the capabilities of the product. Um, and then um, the first part I will go ahead and um, cover, and then Ross will continue with the software demonstration. Uh, so who we are, what we do. We are Spectrum Management Specialists. Spectrum Center is the unification of the former ATD offices in the U.S., UK, and Brazil. Uh, most of you that have attended our previous webinars know this and know that our flagship product is uh, Spectrum E. It's a commercial off-the-shelf software. We can offer it as a SaaS product. That's a software as a service. Um, but also perpetual licensing. And it covers everything, engineering, licensing, uh, e, what we call e-licensing, remote measurement, etc. Um, one of our uh, focuses, uh, business focuses, is providing what we call enterprise solutions uh, based on modified off-the-shelf implementations of Spectrum E. So we modify, we adapt it to meet an enterprise requirement, and uh, we deliver that to our customers. That allows us to maintain a, the core of the product as a commercial system, uh, thus uh, reducing the cost for the customer and as well uh, uh, being able to then adapt and address custom requirements um, in, in addition to that. Um, professional services uh, is also something that we offer, consultancy, measurement drive testing, um, development of custom software solutions, etc. Our offices, um, so we have the following offices. We have Spectrum Center Inc. based out of uh, McLean, Virginia. Uh, we primarily focus on IT Region 2, so that's the Western Hemisphere. Uh, we're established in 1999, and um, we are the product leader. The product is primarily developed out of our office here in, in McLean, Virginia, where I'm from. Um, and we do have, uh, you know, contributors around the world to the product development, but the core product is developed here in the U.S. Uh, we also have Spectrum Center LLC, 
and Spectrum Center also is a, a sister company based out of the U.S. as well, but primarily focusing on the U.S. The federal government and providing uh, professional services in relation to that. Um, then we have Spectrum Center Limited. Uh, right now, it's technically based out of uh, Europe, out of the U.K., uh, West Sussex in the United Kingdom. Um, addresses regions one and three of the ITU, so that's basically the Eastern Hemisphere. Established in 1996, and uh, then we also have Spectrum Center in Brazil. Uh, its focus is Anatel of Brazil, um, and based out of Brasilia, in, in Brazil, the capital of Brazil, and it's established in 2016. Um, this is a little bit of our past customers. We actually have been expanding. We recently were awarded a contract for PTD Myanmar, so I don't have this uh, slide updated with that, but. Uh, we, we did win that contract and uh, we have some growing customers in the region, including Ministry of Communications, as well as several others. You can see in Latin American and Caribbean territory and several more in the U.S. as well. This is more just focusing on uh, different types of international regulatory customers. But we work with the FCC, we work with the NTIA and so forth. So Spectrum Me is the core product that we offer. It is copywritten, branded product here in the U.S. Um, so we offer the product basically in three modules. Uh, we call it e-licensing, technical analysis, and remote monitoring or remote uh, measurement. Um, so those are modules that can be purchased independently. Um, the platform is designed to offer what we call uh, internal external access with the telecommunication regulator. So um, it is uh, designed as a web application. So it can run uh, as a portal where uh, the telecommunication regulator can allow uh, an operator, for example, to, to interact through that portal with the, uh, with the regulatory authority, which is becoming more and more critical in today's operations. So contactless uh, communications, this sort of thing seems to be, um, you know, being observed as a little bit more of like a critical need. Um, today, we're going to just focus on the technical analysis module, uh, and we're going to highlight some uh, specific features uh, related to displaying coverage uh, results. Uh, in terms of implementation, we have a few different options here. We have the local, which is on the left-hand side. And that is basically the customer receives the, the web application software. Um, they can either download it or we can deliver it on a thumb drive. And they can install it in their own internal network, in their own, own uh, server, uh, and communicate to that server through their local area network, through their local in intranet. Or they can install it on their laptop in complete or, or workstation and have it run completely disconnected excuse me, completely disconnected. So it doesn't depend on uh, any kind of internet connection. So I wanna make that clear for people that um, have questions anyway, uh, regarding the, uh, the fact that it's a web application. What we simply mean by that is it uh, runs uh, over a web browser. So you don't need to install an additional software to view or to visualize the interface. Any web browser, any modern HTML5 web browser works with uh, Spectrum. Um, but there is, of course, the cloud version. So that's the commercial cloud option where uh, a customer would connect through any device, whether it's a Mac or a smartphone or a laptop, PC, anything, to the cloud. And then they um, uh, can run the software. And so that, of course, requires an internet connection. We have a secure cloud. It's got encryption. It has everything. We do regular vulnerability analysis on there. Um, but uh, that would be the, uh, the the method of communication. So it'd be coming from that cloud through an internet connection. Um, then there's the third option, which we call hybrid cloud. And hybrid cloud, basically, a uh, customer has to uh, choose how they wish to work. Um, they can develop a local application maybe um, or have an existing uh, system that they wish to interact with uh, ours through a web service so they can call our API through web services as some customers use the tool this way and um, and then they they get the results and so that would be considered hybrid cloud 
where uh, you're not using the whole system, just a portion of it connected through an internet connection, where the other portion is installed locally. Um, or uh, or you could you could have Spectrumy installed locally and then use certain aspects of it online. So we try to make sure all these in very various implementations are synchronized at all times. So updates are released on through Spectrumy. Um, there's a download option where you can get the latest updates to the different components of the system, security patches, updates to any uh, part of the web stack, etc. So we try to keep customers that have the system delivered in any one of these um, uh, uh, manners of implementation uh, updated with the latest changes to the core product. Okay, so that's it for me. Uh, for my part, I think we'll move over to uh, Ross's part. Um, so he's going to take over from here. Thanks very much, Daniel. Um, just a quick one, just to make sure you can everyone can hear me just now. Yep, that looks okay. Perfect. So again, thanks very much, Daniel. Um, I'll be taking you through the, the introduction slides to our topic today and then a demonstration of Spectrum E as well. So what we're going to be looking at today is the some of the types of mapping data available within Spectrum E and what it can support. We're going to then focus on the display um, coverage maps that we can produce. We'll look at line of sight functionality, um, specifically when using high resolution data sets and the differences um, that that gives us. And then go on to talk about some of the motivations for using these high resolution data sets and then key considerations as well that we, we need to take into account. So again, what will be shown is some of the, the capabilities and just to say that the high resolution data is not the panacea when it comes for coverage modelling. Sometimes medium resolution data um, might be perfectly suitable for what you're trying to achieve um, and it really depends the technology and the parameters and effectively the question that you're asking the tool to give you the answer to. Um, so again, we'll discuss what these, uh, these topics mean around the terrain data sets that we'll be using. So we'll talk about low, medium and high resolution terrain data sets. So the way we're going to define that today is low resolution data sets are generally with a horizontal resolution of greater than 50 meters, medium between 10 and 50 meters, and high less than 10 meter horizontal rev resolution. So what that means is if you think about the, the terrain layer as a grid, the, the smallest square um, or tile that makes up that grid would either be greater than 50, between 10 and 50, or less than 10 meters. So within Spectrum E, we have what's called zoom levels, so we can identify what zoom level we're at and what the, the visual terrain interface will look like. So at zoom level eight, um, it's very hard to define the features within the terrain. At zoom level 10, we can start to see uh, valleys forming um, and some other uh, aspects. Again, if you think about your grid at between 10 and 50 meters, you're, no, you're never going to see trees and individual buildings. And that only becomes apparent when we get to a zoom level of 15, um, where our, our high resolution map shows us the individual buildings and trees that we can pick out as well. Um, so again, depending on cost constraints of the project, what one we choose and what one we go with will have a, an impact on the, the project. Again, using high resolution data, and um, will affect system performance as well. So obviously there's a, a larger number of calculations, um, which increases the time as well. We've done things to optimize this within Spectrum E, so um, it, it is relatively fast. Um, but again, if you're using this for large networks, that's when the, the time constraints um, can become apparent. So only in the last couple of years as high resolution data um, became more accessible, uh, maybe the last five to ten years in terms of the computing power to run the calculations and the cost of data acquisition as well. So 
a number of uh, government organisations are collecting this data um, and making it freely available in some countries and the technology has improved so commercial organisations as well can collect and prepare that data for customers. So a couple of the, the concepts about the, the data and that we'll be we're talking about today. Um, so the resolution we've touched on, we have our high, medium and low resolution. Uh, the next topic would be the accuracy of that data as well. So again, we've got our vertical accuracy in terms of for an individual building, effectively how many decimal places. So is it every one meter step we're taking in the, the vertical plane? Or can we do uh, an accuracy of maybe 10 centimetres? And then obviously there'll be an error within that as well. Um, and generally that's stipulated within the data set that we're working with. Um, so also the source of the data is very important. This is extremely important for regulators and spectrum managers who want to be able to replicate the same results over and over again. So having that consistency with the data set and the source um, is very important um, for, for getting these getting this consistency of results. So either open source um, where it's publicly freely available and proprietary sources. So that again has got to be considered um, for the specific project and um, the kind of repeatability um, and consistency of the results as well. So again, LIDAR gets expensive. Um, through proprietary methods, the, the way that the information is captured initially and how it's post-processed as well. So um, what algorithms are used um, can affect the, the output of the data. So again, the consistency of how that data is processed is important as well when we're considering the terrain data. So in terms of a, a practical sense, when is it best to use the different types or the different resolutions? So this will hopefully give a bit more context for the webinar um, and where it's useful to use the, the low, medium and high data sets as well. So there's always cravats for specific technologies and um, certainly the frequency range is, is very important. Um, so we're not going to cover the propagation models and how they are applicable to the, the individual terrain models at the moment, but um, as we get into the demo, we'll share a, a bit of uh, what we've used to, to prepare the um, to prepare these. So certainly with broadcast, um, broadcasters, especially planning and regulating, um, identifying areas of interference, etc., they're generally working with medium to, to low resolution data sets. Um, partly because the areas are so large, using high data sets. Um, are partly the are are generally very expensive, and the computing time and cost um, to to model those systems would would make it infeasible. For VHF UHF mobile systems, again, medium and potentially high resolution data sets can really bring something to the party here, and similar with cellular. When we get to fixed links, so high frequency microwave links. This is where the high resolution data really comes into account. Um, generally with fixed links, they're either going to work or they're not going to work um, to the required standard or, or spec that we're, we're designing them to. So here we get a bit more binary. If we can see the buildings and trees and clutter heights, we can understand if there's going to be any obstructions in our path that will stop these links working. For IoT applications, so kind of low power wide area networks, between medium and high is generally a good kind of starting point. Um, again, within city centres, there's lots of other variables um, and it, it really depends on the objective. So sometimes if it's a, a kind of salesy sort of marketing um, material that you're producing, sometimes you want to see very kind of strong coverage and sort of blanket coverage. Whereas if you're designing a really critical network and um, that its operation has is, is got to be as high as possible, that's where having that granularity um, with a high resolution data sets would really come into play there as well. So 
once we've talked about the terrain, we'll have a look at some of the outputs as well that we'll be covering through the demo um, and where they come into play. So with the high resolution um, data sets, we can see this is a, a city centre. Um, it's a high resolution LiDAR data set. So it's a kind of one metre uh, horizontal resolution. So we can start to create these nice maps. And we've always got to remember that it's a model. Um, when we are looking at this sort of stuff, we want to effectively understand that our propagation model is mimicking what's happening in real life. So we can always get more accurate, um, but nothing beats a site survey, gathering measurements and seeing how that compares to what we're producing on the maps. And again, we, our previous webinar was in correlation with measurements. So we had some automated tools where you can collect the data from out in the field, uh, drive studies, for instance, and see how that matches up. Um, so this field strength map shows the field strength um, using the kind of gradient spectrum palette. Um, so again, depending on the technology and the output that we're, we're looking to achieve, um, the, the specific type of output map um, is important here. So the other option, looking at coverage, is our power received map. So generally, um, some sort of fixed broadband applications would identify a, a power received signal strength, and then that's able to be related to a, a throughput for that system. Um, so that's a, another example. And here we've changed the palette to have discrete um, buckets effectively of signal level. So we can see how that compares as we go further away from our base stations. Another tool that we can use is our best server uh, display option. So it, this looks at, from our sites, at a specific threshold that we set, what is the best site serving each location? So here we can see the, that each colour is associated with one of the sites. And we can see the effectively the footprint where that site is the best server. So in some networks, when we're designing them, we want some overlap within our network, um, partly for handover and as we'll come on to next um, for some other applications. And so here we can see that this pink site is only serving a, a relatively small area in comparison to the other three sites. So this could be optimised um, to expand the coverage range maybe by moving that site site one a bit further to the south. So that our downlink overlap, overlap count um, is our next map. And this shows the number of stations that at a, at a certain threshold um, provide coverage. So as we read off from our key, we can see that the pink areas, there is one station providing coverage. And the yellow areas, there's three stations. And this can be important if we're designing networks where we need multiple overlapping stations to provide coverage. So perhaps for geolocation applications, um, this could be used. Um, so having three sites, we're able to geolocate a, a transmitter or receiver within that, um, within that area. So all these um, display options can be used, um, combining, iterating over the process as we design the network and we identify the coverage area that we're interested in. So when we're looking at fixed links, um, looking at the line of sight coverage from a specific point is important because we want to identify from a certain point, a certain site, what other sites or buildings or streets can we see. So in this instance, this is a built up city centre area and the white areas show from this site location here the other sites that we can see with set transmitter antenna heights and receiver antenna heights. So this gives us a, a, a level of confidence, um, especially as we move out to roll out higher and higher sort of E-band, um, 60, 70 and higher gigahertz links um, within city centres, within kind of dense urban environments. This gives us a, that degree of certainty that before we do the site survey, which is always required, um, we've got a, a greater level of certainty that when we go do that site survey, we're going to have a successful um, link between the two sites. So once we've identified our potential area for our next hop or our 
the, the B end of our microwave link, we can start to look at the profiles between the two locations. Um, so here we've, we've got a profile view cutting across that city centre and we're able to see the individual outlines of the building. So this is the, one of the key strengths of the LiDAR data that we can see the individual um, the building outlines and if you effectively if we were to go straight on into the screen at the moment we'd be going down streets um, as we kind of cut, cut the, the profile in half. Um, and that's quite a powerful way to, again, determine line of sight between certain locations as well. So what we'll do now is we'll move on to the demo. So we'll cover the, the field strength, power received, look at best server downlink overlap count and the line of sight functionality as well. So we'll move on um, and set up our demo of Spectrum E. So as Daniel mentioned, Spectrum E runs from the browser. Uh, We'll just log in here and we'll go to our network page. So we can see we've got a number of sites set up. Um, so I'll just highlight one of the sites and map it on our map so we can see where we're located. So at this level here, we're at zoom level eight. So this is where I was talking about the high, uh, the, the low, medium and high resolution data set. So this is our low resolution data set. So we can see there's not much um, detail um, and as we zoom in, we can start to see that detail. We can see the hills, we can see the, the channels, um, sort of different water courses as well as they go through the environment. So we'll just zoom in uh, to our coverage area here that we're interested in. So now we're down at level 14. When we pop in once more, we get to see that zoomed in area of the city centre that we're working in. So we can see the individual buildings. We can see uh, trees um, and other features as well. So when we uh, put our crosshair over these buildings, we can see that this uh, high resolution data set is made up of two layers. So first of all, we have the terrain height, which in this instance where the crosshair is, is 55 metres above sea level. And then we have the building height or uh, surface obstruction, um, which is 20 metres, 20.3 uh, metres above the terrain height. So effectively, the, the top of that building is about 20.3 uh, 20 metres. If we were to move across here to the, the middle of the road here, we can see that there's no clutter obstruction on that road. And um, so effectively, it's working with two different layers, a digital terrain model and a digital surface model. And the difference between those, those two layers is effectively our building or surface obstruction height. So. What we can do now is oops, uh, we'll have a look at our, our network here. We can compare some of the differences between the, the high resolution data and the low resolution data. So our first prediction that we'll, we'll look at, um, so we'll just turn on our prediction here, is we'll look at the, the low resolution um, so this was using the 1812 model, uh, the ITU 1812 model. So this is our low resolution um, prediction that we carried out of these four stations here. So at a, a kind of a zoomed out level, this is the sort of coverage that we would expect in using um, our medium resolution uh, data set. So that, and within Spectrum E, we've got for the entire world, I think it's 25 meter uh, to 20 meter, depending on the area, terrain resolution um, built in from the box. So whether you access it online in our servers or on your local machine, um, that's the, the default terrain data that you've got access to. So that's, that includes the clutter layer as well. Um, and for this area here, it's generally dense urban um, is, a, is a clutter that we've been using. So we can see here, um, and what I'll do is I'll just take a screenshot so we can compare this within our within our area here. Um, and we can compare this to using the high resolution data set. Um, so obviously we would expect more shadowing, more diffraction around the buildings. Um, so if we just change the display to our map layer. It's maybe 
nicer to show um, using the map player here. I'll just zoom out and just take another screenshot. There we go. Um, what we'll do is we'll turn the prediction on of the high resolution. And we can hear, see here straight away we're getting quite different results from what we were receiving with the low resolution data set. So again, there's not always a, a best answer. It really depends on what the question is that we're trying to um, show the answer to. So whether we want to go down to individual streets um, and individual locations, or if we're happy with a um, happy with the, the kind of further out look at what's happening in in the environment. So again, using the the propagation model, being able to compare this to real life measurements is a way that we can see what model is closest to the real environment. So again, we can see within this area here, it kind of drops off the signal level um, and down at the bottom here as well. Um, but again, when we're looking at sort of effectively the um, the low resolution would be sort of rolling hills with a, a set um, clutter layer on top of that. We don't have the granularity of the, the individual buildings here when we're calculating our coverage. So again, depends on what we're trying to show um, and what, what is the best output um, from the uh, from the the model that, that we're uh, using to create the, the outputs. So to create those uh, field strength coverages, first we would calculate our path loss matrix with the appropriate propagation model. And then what we've used here is the DBM talk out power received function. So what that does is that would create the map, um, our power received map uh, that we've just shown on the screen there. So that gives a, a bit of a, a showcase as to the differences between these two models. Um, what I'll do is I'll just zoom out a bit. And again, when we're looking at larger areas, and when we're looking at um, more detailed networks, the overall picture that we want to show might be different, um, depending whether it's we're asking our sales team or creating tools for our sales team that say, can we get coverage within this area? Um, so what we can show now is just a, a larger network um, and the sort of outputs and the displays that we'll, we'll see here. So if we look at our propagation, our predictions again, look at all the, the low, or the, this is the medium resolution data. So we can see we've got, again, quite a large network. Um, quite a large network here, and we'll compare that with our high resolution map as well. So again, we can see here that we've got a bit of a difference. And again, this really depends on the propagation model. This has not been tuned, so um, understanding um, from, from real life tests is the best way to, to make sure that the model is matching the, the data set that we're, um, that we're looking at as well. So we can see it I kinda, as a general view. Um, this is obviously a lot more green areas, sort of higher signal levels. Um, and that could certainly be to the, the resolution of the terrain um, have an effect, casting shadows over certain areas, and also the way the clutter is treated as well. Um, because the clutter layer acts as a kind of blanket layer um, for a certain, it just gives a certain height. Um, obviously, we won't get the definition for streets, etc. But again, um, for, for broadcasting effectively, when you're looking at wide areas, um, you've got your receive antennas relatively high above the ground. Um, here, we're looking at maybe one or two meters above the ground for receive antennas. So again, it, it, it paints a different picture, um, depending on the technology that we're looking at. So now, what we can do is we can look at our line of sight um, functionality, and then we'll move on to our best server and our downlink overlap count maps as well. So we'll just zoom in here and we'll just turn our first prediction on. 
Um, so here we go. We've got our line of sight with our low resolution, our, our medium resolution maps, I should say. Um, so again here, this is not really providing much useful information in terms of this is from site one, looking at the line of sight. So again, because we're taking everything as a sort of blanket cl clutter heights, um, we've got effectively a rolling sort of terrain in this area as well. We're not getting the definition that we need to get any sort of level of um, accuracy in terms of will this site one be able to see any others of our sites one, uh, our site site one, uh, two or three, etc. And we can just confirm that if we look at site one to site two. Um, we'll just have a look at the profiles maybe between one and two and one and four, just to see what we can see in terms of the profile. So we go from site one to four. Um, so again, I, I've moved these antenna heights up, up what, what I would expect to be above the clutter at these areas. Um, so it would generally be the antenna height. And what we would really look to do in real life is maybe only put that one meter above the top of the building height where the, the antenna is placed. So I would have a look at this. So if we have a look at the model here, so we'll turn off the high resolution clutter heights. Um, clutter should work. Um, so again, here, if we were a couple of meters above, this could be a, a terrain obstruction within the clutter. Um, and even we might not get the definition within the terrain as well to, to block that um, and to create a line, um, the line of sight between the two um, ends. Just close this one. So, there we go. So then, as a Comparison, we'll compare that to the high resolution um, line of sight and see what we can see here. Line of sight one. Put this on. So here we can see that the image is, is very different effectively. So there's only really, by the looks of it, maybe one site, this site two, that potentially we have. Um, the ability to put a, um, have radio line of sight between those two buildings. Um, these other ones here, and what we can do now is just confirm that with the, the path profile. So if we do between one and two, we would expect that one and three, hopefully we'll see an obstruction between those sites. So go one and two. Here, so this just automatically brings up and we can see that the the line of sight here is uninterrupted between the two sites, which is what we'd expect to see. And we'll go one and three. I'll turn this path profile on. And yep, here we can see there's a obstruction here. Um, and then it's in the top of this high building here, the top of this high building here. Um, so again, we can see what we have that we've got from that line of sight that we can we can use. So again, it's very important to make sure that the way that the, the terrain data set has been prepared and processed, that some sort of features like these spiky tops, um, sometimes if maybe you've got a church that when the data was collected, they couldn't work out whether it was 40 meters high or whether it was 60 meters high. So sometimes you get these sort of anomalies um, and that again depends on the way the data is processed. Um, so that shows a bit of the line of sight functionality. Um, and again, to create the, the line of sight on the high resolution data sets, we have an option within our 526 five, five ITU model. Um, so as part of the subpath pull down, we've got the option for line of sight visibility here. And that's what you can use um, when we create the, the path, path loss matrix for that individual site. And then to show that up on the screen, we're just creating a, 
a DBU talk out field strength received map. And then for the specific palette that we use, we're putting a, a zero value for non line of sight and a one um, for the areas where we do have line of sight. Let's update that. Okay. So our next um, maps that we're going to have a look at is the best server and the downlink overlap count. So we can see where they can be used and how we can identify the best locations to, to put our sites when we're planning our network for the, the best kind of optimization of the coverage that we have. So what I'll do is I'll turn on our best server map. So this is for all of our sites. Um, you just close this down. So for the predictions, we can look at the best server for all of our sites. Uh, turn that web map on. We'll just zoom in here. So just for completeness, um, those other sites are stored as incumbents. Um, so this is just a, a very similar object to the TXRX object. It's just a different way to store them so we can switch between the two um, networks. So for our best server here, um, the algorithm automatically chooses colours that are dissimilar to be next to each other, so we don't have overlapping areas um, of, of similar colours, so we can see that all the yellows are, are spread out. Um, and now we can, as we zoom in, we can identify um, specific stations, maybe perhaps this yellow one is not covering a very large area. Um, so maybe that could get put to better use. Um, and either moving it out or removing that site because it would be covered by some of the other sites um, or changing the location. Maybe it's not on top of a building. Um, this is using the high resolution data set. Um, moving it to the top of a, a maybe higher building within the street or um, you could be limited by a number of sites that you have access to and choosing the best sites um, or removing the sites um, from that. So our final prediction that we're going to show is our downlink overlap. So it's for all the sites again. Again, this is with the high resolution data set, so it's all there's a lot more detail in here that we, we might need. Um, generally you'd probably do this at a bit of a higher level. Um, so again, this map would take a, a bit longer than running it for um, running it for the network. Um, so there we go. So what I'll do in this one is just compare these two. Um, so so this detail here that was we're maybe not requiring that level of detail um, for our downlink overlap count. Um, so we can see there's quite a lot of blue areas that we've got two or more, eh, or one or two um, stations providing coverage to the. the the threshold that we set. Um, what we can do is for that network, this incumbent network, what we'll do is we'll run the path loss matrix. Um, so we'll run it for 1.5 kilometres around each station. We'll leave our default um, standard clutter resolution. For terminal clutter losses, we'll put them at receiver and profile sample will make this 200. So I'll just sample the, the terrain so we can see that that's it. Bear with me. I just need to do that again. I just need to put it for all objects this time. Receiver. So run that again. So so run it um, because it's quite a, a short distance that we're running and um, because we're using the medium resolution terrain this processing of all the path loss matrix for this is around about 100 stations uh, should take about 30 seconds to complete um, so 
Spectrum E runs these in parallel, so we're not waiting a hundred times for each of them to complete. Um, depending on the computing resource, uh, we'll be using the the different um, the different processors and splitting up the job, um, which reduces the time massively, especially for large um, kind of national networks. So here we're going to use the downlink overlap count. This is downlink overlap. Um, so this is eighteen twelve, and this is low resolution. So for our threshold, we've set this at negative ninety dBm, um, and again, depending on the, just select all of these again, then like overlap count negative ninety, eighteen twelve, low. Go. That will create our map for us. So it looks like we've set the threshold, uh, maybe not high enough for this one. Um, so let's just go a bit lower just so we can have some um, and cover that count. So egg, one ten. I'll just call it down link overlap. Mm. So there we can see the, the individual overlaps between the stations. And again, <clears throat> a very early stage of designing our network and to move some and optimize some of these sites, we could maybe cull out some of the ones that we don't need um, and move some of the existing sites to either change the antennas, uh, we could sectorize them if that would benefit, um, and other options for, for designing the network at this early stage. Um, so that's just a very brief um, overview of some of the coverage options. Um, I've introduced some of the terrain uh, details as well. Um, and what we'll do now is we'll open up the floor, see if we've had any questions throughout the presentation, and uh, we'll discuss there. So, yep, okay, so our final slide on. No problem. So, we got a few questions. Um, we'll go over a few of them here. So there's uh, information on getting uh, uh, more access to uh, information on Spectrum E, so you can go to our YouTube channel. There's a link on the handout, or you can also look at Spectrum Center uh, on YouTube. You should be able to find us. Um, our public-facing website, public.spectrum.center, or if you just go to spectrum.center and you click on the company name at the bottom, it'll take you to our website that includes information about our product and pricing and things like this. And also we have a LinkedIn page where you can find more information about us. Um, there's a link on that as well. Or all, if you look at Spectrum Center too, in, uh, in LinkedIn, you should be able to find us. So a couple questions. Um, uh, and I, well, I think we'll hand off between answering them between uh, Ross and myself. So first question is in one of the slides, why is the coverage more pessimistic in the medium resolution? Okay, um, so that was uh, probably one of the earlier slides you were showing, Ross. Um, I would say yeah. the, uh, or, or I think part of the demo you had shown that the coverage was- Part of the demo. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I, I can handle that one, Ross. Um, so yep. the coverage is a little more pessimistic in this. That was an interesting uh, scenario. I think Ross had brought that up that, um, and I don't know if we highlighted the clutter view uh, for you to see, but in medium resolution, the clutter is, um, um, so it was uh, it was part of the webinar presentation when, Rob showed, when Ross showed the medium resolution coverage in a particular area inside of a box and uh, the coverage was uh was in lower resolution and so it, it it looked like the coverage was weaker working with the medium resolution data when and then we compared it to the high resolution output it looked um like it was uh better so that was a little ca counterintuitive um, one would think that the coverage would be more pessimistic when you use less detailed data and may i'm sorry um 
will be more pessimistic when you use more detailed data because you have more detail about the obstruction information and less pessimistic or more optimistic where you have what we call medium resolution or less detailed data. So this is the clutter layer, the medium resolution clutter layer that's included in Spectrum E by default. For It's different in every part of the world. Um, the U.S. is a little more fragmented and granular. It depends on the clutter extraction technique. But in Europe, I think we're mostly working with current land cover clutter for the global European coverage. And uh, as you can see, uh, it's uh, it's got it's got a kind of a simplistic shape to it, uh, to the clutter areas, uh, to the different uh, designated um, geographic zones. So urban, dense urban, open, rural, things like this. Um, so the thing is with certain propagation models, um, there's clutter heights that are attached to those uh, different clutter categories. And so the heights are treated as like a uniform obstruction. So the nodes will hit those uh, obstructive areas and then, you know, we'll model it as an aggregate block. So it can make it a little more frag, a um, little more pessimistic overall. Uh, and then when you use the medium resolution coverage, and then when you use the high resolution uh, data, the DSN data that Ross highlighted earlier, you can actually see the the, the coverage going through the alleyways and the, the different paths and, and stuff like this. So that becomes a little more clear and and easier to visualize. Um, and And so that also allows for the coverage to look a little more optimistic, you could say. Um, so I think that's basically what we noticed that, um, you know, there can be interesting benefits to using high resolution versus medium resolution. It's not necessarily always going to be, um, uh, you know, going to give you uh, a more uh, pessimistic result. In some scenarios, kind of somewhat dense urban areas, uh, high resolution data, if you're working with a non line of sight technology in particular, it can give you a more optimistic output. Whereas the uh, medium resolution clutter, just because of the uh, kind of simplistic nature of it, can give you maybe a more uh, pessimistic output. So the, the next question is, what is the best resolution terrain for modeling land mobile radio? Um, so the best resolution terrain is, um, that's a good question. And this is maybe related to another question on your on the stars that were assigned to the different columns in uh, slide 12, I believe. So um, if you can go to slide 12, Ross, in your PowerPoint, that would probably be a good idea. <clears throat> so here, what you can see is um, you have the, the, the stars, I think maybe weren't clear what they meant. Um, what we're saying here is basically, in our from our experiences, what is the relevancy of low, medium, and high resolution terrain uh, and clutter data when modeling those different types of radio technologies? Because radio technologies tend to work in specific frequency ranges. So uh, broadcast and what we call VHF, UHF mobile, in this case would be applicable to maybe land mobile radio, um, you don't get a great benefit. Well, you get some benefit from working with high resolution data, but not as much as you would think. Um, you definitely probably don't need high resolution data or it's probably the, the return isn't great on the investment of obtaining it when working in broadcast because of what Ross mentioned, the distance, the amount of uh, the, 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 the calculation distances and per, more points of information for a broadcast system usually covering out to 100 kilometers or, or, or something like or more. So that's a lot of points of information to process. It's more computation uh, demands on your on your on the software on your on your hardware, and uh, the return on the investment you could say maybe not enough to to uh, warrant going in that direction. So medium resolution is considered more the most relevant. That's why it gets three stars. And then for certain other applications and broadcasts like low resolution, uh, I'm sorry, uh, frequency coordination, regulatory activities, that may even be preferable, um, uh, low resolution. And so while high resolution can bring some value in a broadcast network design, it uh, it's probably the least relevant. Um, and whereas in mobile, it's kind of almost the reverse to a degree, 
where low resolution terrain data probably is not useful at all or very not there's not a lot of relevancy to it um i wouldn't say useful at all. i mean if for again for frequency coordination purposes especially because some frequency coordination models kind of are constrained to only work with low resolution terrain and clutter data or very simple terrain and clutter data um there is some degree of relevancy working in low resolution for vhf uhf mobile but again the best um the best option is, is medium resolution. Uh, high resolution is uh, a little more relevant. Um, so that's why you have that option uh, in high resolution to be at two stars. Um, it can be sometimes useful. Again, the ranges, the power levels of a mobile station is gonna be lower than a broadcast. So you, uh, you may need to have a little more detail in your path profile. But what seems to work the best is medium. And the one thing that we noticed is in some applications, low resolution becomes completely irrelevant. We didn't even assign it a star, such as fixed links and SHF band or IoT. And then one other thing that we noticed that it, we would think that IoT would have been more relevant to use high resolution data, but an interesting uh, consequence of our experiences was the purpose of the modeling. So in terms of network planning or deployment uh you know maybe having a little more detail more granularity in your terrain data is relevant so high resolution data has more relevancy that's why you get you know you get the rare fragmented coverages and tells you uh, exactly where you might get coverage or overlap or whatever for example microwave link design you kind of need that that level of granularity because it's very binary you either have a connection or you don't but in IoT, because the purpose tends to be with the customers that we work with, sales oriented, um, doing pre-sales and marketing, and um, you know the interference is mitigated in different ways. The high resolution result actually is a little more confusing, and we've noticed our customers actually prefer to work in medium resolution so they could get a, a simpler type of coverage display. And I think that was the purpose of Ross's. Uh, final part of his presentation was to highlight how the medium resolution data actually had a little simpler picture that uh, that kind of uh, you know made sense to most people. And we see the same in cellular. Actually, cellular operators, while they do uh, enjoy using high resolution data, overall they seem to prefer medium resolution simply because um, they're just trying to protect project a general coverage capability um, and so if you look at cellular operator coverage maps they're not super fragmented they're fairly simplified um, because they're trying to project either for compliance purposes or marketing purposes uh, a, a coverage capacity and a high, highly fragmented coverage map is not going to communicate that very well so um, while they do go into high resolution modeling, especially uh, maybe for a little bit for 5G because it works in a higher frequency band, um, generally the coverage maps seem to work. Though the one, the, the coverage level of um, terrain resolution data, I should say, um, well, and clutter resolution data that cellular operators tend to prefer medium resolution. And uh, what is, uh, oh, that's another question. What are the benefits of using high resolution for 5G kind of? related to the question we just had. Uh, there's plenty of benefits. Uh, depends on what frequency band you're operating in. Uh, 5G is operating multiple bands. Generally, the higher you go, the more important it is to have high resolution data. Um, so, um, you know, if you're working in the higher frequency bands, the SHF bands of 5G, obviously, just like we describe in this in this table, you, you kind of really need high resolution data. The, 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 the analysis is very binary. Um, whereas in, uh, in lower bands, maybe, you know, it'd be, uh, the lower bands of 5G, maybe the 4.2 gigahertz or, or lower, uh, medium resolution may, may be better. Um, also the volume of, uh, BTS sectors that an operator would normally model is in the tens of thousands or oftentimes, or even hundreds of thousands or millions, depending on the size of the network. Um, but uh, processing that many uh, objects in the simulation model uh, at high resolution can be highly demanding in computational resources. That is something that spectrum can do. That is something we do 
with some of our customers that uh, need to model operator networks, that need to model hundreds of thousands or if not millions of sectors. Um, but uh, obviously in those cases, you need to start to like uh, make things go a little more streamlined and um, you may consider working at medium resolution instead of high resolution, just because the number of points to process is, is extremely high for that. Okay, I think those are all the questions. I think we're okay. If anyone has any more comments, please let us know. We'd be more than happy to be in touch. Uh, you can contact us at sales at spectrum.center if you don't already have our contact information. And uh, what well, this video will be uploaded to our YouTube channel shortly, and we'll have a follow-up survey that'll probably come out later in the week, uh, next week. So um, thank you again, everybody, and uh, have, stay safe and have a good rest of the week. Thanks very much. Have a good, good week.